thank, thank you very much, Matt. Um, as Matt said, I'm not a property guy, or I wasn't a property guy. My background has been uh, primarily um, technology, and I'm going to um, talk through some of my experiences there and hopefully help show how it, that kind of background will um, influence prop tech um, and give you some thoughts on prop tech going, going forwards. So Matt asked me to touch on kind of four different things. Uh, the first one was a little bit about my background and what I've done, um, just to context why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Uh, to touch on the evolution of tech and prop tech and why it is so important and why you need to, um, uh, to, to, to watch what's happening here because it's, it's going to happen and it's going to happen fast. Um, I will talk about PR, PR, uh, the private rented sector, Insights and Vesta, um, obviously giving my business a plug um, as I must. Um, and I'll leave you with some thoughts, if we've got time, on um, some predictions of what I think might happen in the kind of prop tech world um, going forward. So I've tried to um, uh, build my background into a, 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 a few slides, and I'll just quickly talk you through it. So I started off in banking, uh, retail banking in New Zealand, uh, focused on product, uh, distribution and innovation. I came out to the UK, um, uh, worked for Aviva, which was Norwich Union back then, setting up distribution for uh, Norwich Union Bank, and was an, involved in equity release, a top-up mortgage, um, and savings accounts. Now, the one interesting um, point around that is I met some interesting people back in the day. So I went into one of my client's uh, offices who was a mortgage packager, and... Um, he would be. I'd been dealing with him for about six months. Really nice guy, uh, very smart, very forward-thinking. And he took me around the corner, literally to a little alleyway like that. It was the fire escape, and he had four or five people sitting there. And he said to me, "This is my future. I've bought all these URLs, and these guys are going to build something which I think one day will be really, really big." Um, his name was Simon Nixon. Um, if you don't know the name, MoneySupermarket.com. Um, so. Very early on, I got, um, uh, I should have gone and worked for him. <laughs> um, however, I chose to go and work for um, John Charcoal. I was asked, they were another one of my clients, and I was asked to join their team that were building the first online mortgage broker, uh, Charcoal Online, um, which was an amazing uh, time for me. It was when kind of the e-commerce world was really booming. Um, and to put it into perspective on how big that was, we did um, a billion pounds of mortgages online, and um, two, two in every three customers who went into a bank or went in to see a broker took a charcoal online quote with them to discuss their mortgage. Um, that's how significant it was. Bradford and Bingley bought it, and I ended up being head of e-commerce for Bradford and Bingley and looking after charcoal online. Um, I also went through mortgage regulation for about nine months of my life and decided I'd had enough of that scene and wasn't going to work in a regulated environment again and I moved into travel. I was approached by a, um, an amazing uh, Texan um, who was the, the CEO of um, My Travel, um, had the Stetson and the boots and everything um, and he asked me if I'd come and transfer my uh, knowledge of selling complex products online into the travel world. So I joined My Travel. For those of you who, who, who may have been around back then, My Travel was a mess. It had just been bailed out by the banks. I joined when it was doing 3% of its business online. And um, we were bought or we merged with Thomas Cook. At that point in time, we were doing 30% of our distribution uh, online. Um, and it was a fantastic time. Did more or less the same thing at Thomas Cook. Took them from 9% to 30% um, over two years. Um, and then decided I wanted to do something on my own um, and set up what I thought would be the McKinsey of e-commerce, um, helicoptering into businesses, um, helping sort out their e-commerce, and then moving on to the next business. Um, I did about four or five different engagements, um, and then I uh, went to work for the CEO um, of the UK for HomeServe for six weeks. Um, nine months later, um, I was still there, um, loved it, it was a great fun, but I spent nine months of my life uh, living away from home, um, which was uh, slightly problematic for me, 
um, because at the same time I started playing uh, touch rugby for England um, and I was away during the week and then I was away training on the weekend. Um, I'm a married guy and things didn't work out very well on that front. My wife put her foot down and said, Russell, you've got two choices. Um, either you stop consulting and get a job and come home more often or you give up touch rugby. Uh, so I stopped consulting. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, was fortunate, um, and I won't say any more about that, to uh, be introduced to a guy called Errol Damelin. Um, for those of you who don't know that name, he was the founder of Wonga. Um, he asked me to join Wonga to build a commercial offering. Um, and I joined, uh, started from scratch, built a business uh, which we called Wonga for Business. Very quickly realized um, the biggest referral um, uh, opportunity in SMEs and business is um, to other SMEs and there's no way in hell they are going to recommend a, biz a business lender called Wonga. So we rebranded to Everline, um, ran that for two years, growing it, uh, fantastic business. We used to lend um, at one point up to 150 grand in 90 seconds. Um, the biggest weakness in the business was we could make that decision and transfer the money that fast, but we had to wait 15 minutes for the bank to catch up and get the money to the um, SME's account. Um, uh, Wonga then had some issues, um, and I sat down with the chairman and we agreed to uh, sell Everline. It was bought by an Israeli business called Easy Bob, and they asked me to join them and help set up their UK operations for them. So I did that for a year. Um, and then went and joined Blue Zest. Blue Zest was a mortgage lender. So you'll see there's a theme of lending related to property all the way through here, although I've never really been involved in property until now. Um, Blue Zest was an online mortgage lender. It was gonna change the face of the way the um, mortgage industry worked. Unfortunately, cash was tight. Um, and we got to a point where, um, due to a few issues with one of the founders, I decided it was getting too messy, so I decided to leave and go and consult again. Um, I'd been advising a business called Funding Exchange, which is another commercial um, uh, online broker. Um, uh, they're pretty big at the moment, a great business, and I ended up joining them as an interim COO, um, helping them out again for another nine months. Um, at which point I was approached about Vesta and I'll come back to Vesta shortly but it was such an opportunity, it was an uber moment for me so I felt I had to do it. Um, so this is what I'm doing today. I also advise Griffin which is a startup bank which I was going to co-found until I saw Vesta. Um, I advise Altruist which is an analytical platform for institutional lenders and lenders that invest via peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, uh, I also advise TSB, the commercial part of the business, um, not the consumer part, and I am a mentor for Cambridge Judge Business School's entrepreneurship program. Enough about me. So what have I learned over my years about um, technology and, and how, do, how will that influence PropTech? Well, the first thing, this is a slide I borrowed from Google. Now the interesting thing here is this is 2009, um, uh, actually e-consultancy this one. The important thing here is this is years down the bottom and up here is um, users uh, in the millions. So radio took nearly 40 years to get to 50 million users. TV took about 15 years. The internet took three. The iPhone took uh, one and a half, two, two, two and a half. Um, if you think about what's come after that, you've got um, things like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Uber, um, Just Eat. They are happening in less than a year, and that's how fast technology is moving. There was a time when I was involved in e-commerce where there was a big debate about, you know, will, will mobile ever be big? Um, and think about how many people have um, mobile today. Are you, I've used a couple of examples because I think it, it helps shape um, some of the conversation. I'm sure you've all have all heard of this and you've all seen, seen it, the Kodak moment. In 1996, it was worth 28 billion, 140,000 employees. 
In 2012, it was bankrupt with 17,000 employees. Um, before I talk about um, Instagram, um, I didn't know this, but I found out the other day, uh, Kodak, an employee from Kodak, invented the digital camera and pretty much was told to put it back in the closet because it would kill their photo business. What a mistake. Um, interesting here, 2012, um, Facebook acquired Instagram for a billion pounds and there were 13 employees. And I think that just highlights how fast technology can evolve and change if you don't keep up with it. Um, just some, some more examples. Um, uh, this is a slide from Google. So think about the effect that Google has had on advertising firms. Think about the effect Amazon has had on retail stores. Um, WhatsApp on long distance calls, Spotify on music, eBay on local stores. Um, if you follow Netflix, they're starting to make their own movies now, so they're disenfranchising the whole movie world. Um, you've got SpaceX, you've got Tesla. You look how that's changing the whole car market. Um, I mentioned Uber. Look how Uber has completely changed the way we travel. Um, uh, I had an a, a interesting look at Just Eat um, a number of years ago. Actually, the Just Eat CEO introduced me to Errol Demlin. Um, and what's interesting is it was the, 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 the most amazing business and then all of a sudden Deliveroo comes along and it kind of loses some of its uh, market presence and now Uber Eats comes along with their budget and it's going to lose even more. So the market is almost um, disrupting the disruptors. It's moving so quickly. So let's talk about property and what's happening in property. I'm, I can talk about a number of different prop tech initiatives. Um, uh, you know, commercial uh, leak bots that sit on pipes that warn you when you've got a leak in your house when you're away skiing. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to focus on what I now know, um, which is the agent market. And all of you will be aware of what's happening in what I call the owner-occupier market, where the purple bricks, the right move, the Zoopla, um, etc., have completely changed the way that market works by using. Um, part digital, um, part um, uh, manual or offline um, to completely change the way these businesses operate. Now it's not the end of those businesses but they're going to have to change the way they work if they want to keep up because there are already businesses developing here which are going to disrupt these guys and they will be out in the market very very soon. Um, the interesting thing which I just wanted to highlight is there's not much happening in the investor space or there wasn't much happening in the investor space. So let me talk about um, the private rented sector and just give you a snapshot. Now, most of you will, uh, well, some of you will know about this, but I think it's important I do set the scene. Um, uh, as a startup, we want to solve a problem. The problem that we're trying to solve um, is when you look to sell an investor, uh, a um, rental property, the first thing an agent will tell you to do is you need to remove your tenants. Um, if, if you don't remove the tenants, the tenants will make it harder for you to sell to the owner-occupier market, um, uh, which is not helpful, uh, or the tenant will just leave and leave you in the lurch anyway. Now the problem with that is it costs landlords over £500 million a year in lost rental income, if you take into account the time it takes to sell a property. Um, that causes massive problems. We had a woman the other day call us up who was advised by an agent kick your tenants out, uh, in seven months she still hasn't sold the property, she's used up all of her savings to cover the costs, she's now going to have to sell that property at a massive discount just to get it sold, otherwise she's going to lose it. Um, so it's not a great way to work. Um, you also displace tenants, uh, which is far from ideal. Um, you know, uh, if, if tenants look after you by paying the rent um, and you don't need to, don't displace them. Um, and then probably the biggest and most important one is there is no central place to go and look for investment property. You have to compete in the open market with everybody else or buy something off market or build it yourself. Now, putting some facts and figures around that, um, the, the number of rental property sales in the UK are increasing and increasing at a massive rate. I mean, just look at some of those numbers there and the percentage that want to sell. Um, the primary two reasons are uh, the government's not been helpful from a tax perspective um, with mortgage interest. 
Um, and secondly, a lot of people who've built up portfolios in the retirement world, uh, sorry, are now getting to the retirement age and they wanted to release some of that um, so they have the funds for their retirement. Um, at the same time, there are more and more people wanting to rent. Um, people are choosing to rent because they want to keep their options open for work or they simply can't afford to get onto the, uh, the property ladder. Um, now, this is a stat that really stood out for me, and this is one of my kind of, uh, I talk about an Uber moment. Two and a half percent of the PRS market in the UK is owned by institutions. Now, if you compare that to the USA, Netherlands, and Germany, where it's 25 percent plus, you can see there's a huge gap there. Now, the reason for that gap primarily is because most of the PRS stock in the UK is owned by private individuals, you know, people in this room. And it's very hard for an institution to buy um, en masse from uh, that kind of disparate group. Uh, yet 20% of all UK property transactions, residential transactions, um, are already PRS or investment property. So it is already a huge market. For me, the second Uber market, uh, sorry, Uber moment, 20% you know, of the market is not being catered for properly. Um, to put it into perspective, some numbers, uh, 1.4 trillion in 2016 growing to 1.7 trillion uh, over the next 10 years, uh, 5.7 million homes to 7.2 million homes, and the interesting one is 20% of all homes in the UK are rented, and it's going to grow to 25%, and I suspect that's probably underplayed. Um, those stats are from PwC and Savills, and I'm keen to see their next version of those because I think they're going to project... Uh, continued and increased growth on that front. And so the solution um, is a dedicated marketplace for buying and selling uh, rental property with tenants in place. Um, it saves landlords over 500 million pounds a year, encourages longer tenancies and is socially good for uh, tenants. Um, and uh, by launching this, we have now created a single one-stop shop to buy investment property, whether you're an individual or an institution. Um, quick snapshot of what Vesta is. Uh, you think of all the different types of sellers you might have in the market, accidental landlords, developers, house builders. Um, uh, I talked about landlords who are wanting to release some of the properties to, um, to retire, etc., or change the makeup of their portfolio. And on the buyer side, you have more or less the same group of people, but just at different stages of their kind of um, uh, rental build program. Um, we sell uh, individual houses and apartments. We sell blocks, broken, unbroken, with freehold, without freehold, uh, student portfolios, student blocks. Um, an interesting one is um, retirement homes. A lot of the older people who are now getting to retirement age are cash rich from an income perspective but don't have the asset to sell to buy the rental property sorry buy their retirement home so there's a great opportunity for retirement home builders to now utilize a platform like this to um, effectively sell uh, rental properties to an investor market and then look after um, the, the, the retire retirees in, 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 in those homes um, we also sell portfolios um, and we are starting to make our way into the, the off-plan space. Um, one big difference about the way we operate is we don't charge commissions. Uh, we charge 900 quid upfront to sell per unit um, or 1500 on completion. And because we're a marketplace, we don't represent buyer or seller. Typically, there are some instances where we will. Um, but we so we charge a buyer 900 pounds including VAT on an offer being accepted. Now, the idea there is it's a commitment um, that's per unit, and we are trying to remove gazumping. We have an agreement with the seller that once we've collected that 900 quid, we will take the property off the market and they will accept no further um, offers from us or anybody else, or we charge them the 900 pounds to recoup it. Um, we're kind of a hybrid, I guess, between a purple bricks and a right move or a zoopla. So um, if you are a landlord and want to sell direct, we will provide you with the online agent service to prepare everything and put it onto the marketplace. If you're an agent, um, uh, you've already done all the work, so we will list it for you at a reduced fee and you can manage the viewings. If you're a managing agent, it's a fantastic way to, to help promote to your landlords 
a way of selling because the managing agent will retain the services. Um, we're building in mortgages, conveyancing, a limited company wrapper, accounting services, um, uh, insurance, etc., cetera, um, to help make it easier um, for people to get into the market in a much, much simpler, um, simpler way. Um, last slide, I think. Uh, second to the last slide. Um, so I talked about that at the start. I'm hoping we will be the, uh, the Amazon or the Uber um, in this space and change the way the market works. Um, we won't disenfranchise the rest of these guys because a lot of them are talking to us about um, putting their rented properties um, on our platform. So we're embracing them and helping them sell um, more efficiently. And last but not least, um, how are we doing? We launched on the 8th of February um, last year, so we're one year old now. Um, we've gone through a series of stages as we've built out the, um, the marketplace. Um, the trajectory that we have, I think, is pretty promising. It, you know, it's still early days, but effectively the tur turquoise is um, instructions. We're just shy of 300 million pounds worth of instructions so far. Um, and the orange is um, uh, effectively uh, offers that have been accepted that are either subject to contract or going through um, further due diligence. Um, so I wasn't a property guy until um, about 14, 15 months ago. Um, I had bought three properties myself prior to that um, and done them up. And the first deal I did in property was a 22 million pound sale. So I'm learning very, very quickly how to uh, operate in this space. Um, some thoughts. So when I first got to the UK 20, 20, 20 years ago, um, 21 years ago, um, I I'm, I'm, need to be careful because this is being filmed, but I met a guy who ran a shoe business, an amazing shoe business, a brand that some of you will know. Um, and I talked to him about online and said, you should set up a website. He had an amazing business. He was selling tons and tons. He had about 10 stores. Um, and I said, you've got to put it online. You'll sell truckloads. And he said to me, Russell, you're an idiot. No one will ever buy shoes online. They want to try them on. They want to feel what they look like. Um, and he used to have queues outside of his stores in summer. About four years later, he launched a website that allowed shoes to be sold. It was live for less than a month and then he took it down because he ran out of shoes in his stores. He sold so much online. So my point there is you must embrace online. You must embrace technology. It is coming whether you like it or not. And if you adapt, there are huge rewards at the end of um, uh, whatever it delivers to your business. That's me.